pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with the Try a Chapter Tag, which was originally created by Book Paradise. I'll put the link to the original video in the show notes. And I have seen several Booktubers do it, but most recently, Sabrina over at Unmanaged Mischief has been using it to cull her library before she packs up and moves across the country. And so I thought I would try to do it for much the same reason, although I've already moved into my new apartment. I didn't move across the country, but I moved from one apartment into another. And I should have started doing this before. It would have saved some of my friends some of their strain, back strain, and maybe would have saved some of my friendships. I also thought that my page 112 tag would work really well for culling books that I actually am not interested in reading. It would be much more ruthless one page. You get one page to impress me. If I'm not impressed by page 112, the book's gone. But I decided I want to give my subscribers a little bit of a break from page 112. I've got them coming out on a weekly basis for book hauls and blind exchanges and whatnot. So I think I'm going to use the try a chapter tag for culling my library. So I'm going to read the first chapter or the first 20 pages or so. I'll, that'll, I'll play that by ear for four books for this video, and let me show you what they are. The first one is an Australian novel that none of my bookish Australian friends have ever heard of, The Drowner by Robert Drew. I bought it at a used bookstore here in Tokyo a couple years ago. It's quite a lovely soft cover, published in 1996. So, any of you heard about it? The premise is quite intriguing. Oh, the story starts in Wiltshire. Yeah, oh my goodness, it sounds really magical. A man called Alphabetical Dance, that's his name, shows his small son the ancient art of floating land. He is the last of the drowners. His son William, however, puts his faith in the modern art of engineering, leaving his father's sodden pagan landscape behind him. And then the story goes to Australia a kaleidoscopic novel mingling history, myth, and technology with a modern, cinematic, and poetic imagination. So yeah, nobody's heard of it. I'm going to read it a few pages and let you know how I make out. I hope I like it. I'm worried about the magic stuff, because I hate magic in fiction. Next is a novel by a British gay novelist, Patrick Gale, A Perfectly Good Man. 2012. I read his most recent novel. He's got a new one coming out in a few months, I believe, but he put out a new a novel a couple years ago that was actually, part of the story was set in small town Saskatchewan. It was about a gay man who, uh, he gets outed and his wife's family sends him to Canada, to, to, to Homestead, to get him the heck away from his wife and kid. And it's about his his experiences there. And I thought it was good. I, like, I didn't love it, but I really liked it. And I'd read one of his early novels, The Aerodynamics of Pork. And all I remember about it from 20 years ago is it didn't impress me very much. But I've got this one. So I'm going to try it. And this one, it's about a group of characters, including a priest in a small town in the UK somewhere called Penzance. I'm not going to try to describe it more. I'll tell you more once I've read a bit. And I've had this on my shelf for a couple of years, The Natural Way of Things by Charlotte Wood. It got, there was a lot of buzz around it. A lot of, I wasn't on BookTube, but I assume there was a, quite a lot of BookTube love for it. There certainly was on the bookish podcasts. The readers, Simon Savage, loved it. I think that's why I bought it. But the more I hear about it, I don't think it's for me, and I, I don't know that I want to read another dystopian novel about misogyny but if it's really good I might so I'm gonna try a chapter it's certainly a lovely cover this one is about a group of women that have been they're cap held captive by some actual sociopath so it sounds really disturbing oh and I'd, I'd forgotten she's Australian so it's an Australian novel two Australian so far and the last one for this batch, I like the title, We Weren't Lovers Like That by Nabtej Sarna. 
Who the heck is he? He is an Indian writer and a diplomat. And this is his debut novel, published in 2003. I bought this quite recently, my last trip to the used bookstore in Tokyo, and I had enough money to get one more book, and I went, did one more perusal of the shelves, and my eye always goes to the authors and titles that I've never heard of before, and pulled this off, gave it a quick look, and thought, okay, it'll be okay. And it was like $3 or $4 or something. So it's about an Indian man whose wife has taken their kid and, uh, and left him, and he goes to his hometown and reflects on his life. So very uh, much of a literary cliché. I think I looked at page 112 and wasn't particularly impressed. So yeah, I'm going to read a chapter. It has a bookmark. Experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes, Oscar Wilde. So I will let you know. But the uh, title's interesting. We weren't lovers like that. I wonder what that means. So I'll be back later. Hey, I'm back and I have good news. And not necessarily good news for my calling project, but good news about this book, The Drowner by Robert Drew. I really enjoyed the first 20 pages. This is a keeper. I don't know what's going to happen after the first 20 pages. And I did read the back more carefully to find out that there is a protracted love story which hasn't started yet and I'm not a big fan of those so it's it still may end up being a bail but no I was really impressed with the first 20 pages there's no magic or I don't think there is this drowning was an actual agricultural kind of irrigation technique in Wiltshire historically and it's something to do with managing the hatches and flooding the land at the right times to maximize the agricultural uh, output not magic I was kind of envisioning divination or something but no uh, there might be a little bit of that but I was charmed by the writing even though it's ever so slightly overwritten a little bit of adjectival diarrhea but not enough to to detract from from the story the characters we see them, the protagonist as a very young boy and his dad's carrying him out onto the meadow and that scene is so vividly described and at the very beginning there's a couple italicized scenes and I don't like italics but they're very short and it seems to be one of them seems to be maybe the protagonist is a very old man in hospital I said that the the father his name was alphabetical dance I can now explain why his name was Arthur Brabazon Charles dance so a b c and so he got the nickname alphabetical so that's kind of cute and he seems like quite a character uh, where I knew that this was going to be a keeper was a scene between him and his mum when the, the protagonist is a teenager and they're of different con they belong to different strands of the church the chapel and the church does anybody from the UK know what that would mean she and her the children were chapel and he was church and that's capitalized. I have no idea what that means. But anyway, the dad, AB, the alphabetical dance, is teasing the mom about baptism and talks about earth bathing as the new form of, of baptism. And he's totally just yanking her chain. I'm just going to read this section. This is what he says to, to his wife. Baptism by soil certainly makes a change. That Dr. Pug and Miss Arundel in Urchfont got themselves buried naked up to their heads for six hours a day. Stuck it out for nine days, I hear. Beautifully powdered and dressed, the heads appeared not unlike two fine cauliflowers. So, a little bit of humor, and uh, I, I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. So, I checked him. He's got a Wikipedia page. It's kind of a hodgepodge of stuff but uh, he's written several novels and plays and he started out as a journalist he's been married four times this book is not in print at least not on Amazon Japan so hard to track down some of his other stuff's on Scribd but not this so I don't know if anybody out there would be interested in buddy reading it with me at some point because it's hard to track down but probably easier to find in Australia so I'm looking at you Leah Ange, anybody else I'm gonna give it a try 
I like farm fiction and there's a real agricultural element to the way that the novel opens and the way that the the drowner floods the meadows and how he controls it to maximize the vegetative capacity of the meadows. It's really interesting. So I'm going to give it a try. I will be back in a day or so with my thoughts on the second book. Hey, well, I just read the first chapter of Patrick Gale's A Perfectly Good Man. I really liked it, so I'm not doing so well because I want to, I'm not getting rid of this one either. It opens, the chapter's called Lenny at, Lenny at 20. And uh, Lenny is a 20 year old, uh, yep, Lenny is a 20 year old Cornish guy in a wheelchair. And he has just moved out of his mum's and living in a very wheelchair accessible kind of subsidized apartment and he really likes the apartment so it's kind of a shock because he's just moved in that within a few pages and I'm not telling you anything that's not on the back cover he that he's planning to end his life and probably that very day I don't know when, he, there's several references to the accident that r caused him to be a paraplegic, but I don't know how far, and how long ago it was. It doesn't sound like it was really recent, but he's writing letters to his ex fiance and his mother. And then again, we soon find out that he's planning to kill himself using, what's the name of that drug? It's a powerful barbiturate, barbiturate. Nembutal and he does this elaborate test to make sure because he got it through the black market to make sure that it's actually not fake and he does this little test tube thing and it, and it turns out positive and he's so happy so it's really dark and really compelling and he seems like a really nice guy and it's like what 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 and I like reading fiction with disabled characters because there ain't much out there so I hope it doesn't end up being successful. I know a little bit more having read to the end of the first chapter than I will tell you just because even though it's the first chapter, I don't want to spoil things, but I was really attached to him. So I hope something happens <laughs> that he doesn't. He ends up meeting his priest and the priest Barnaby is going to end up becoming one of the main characters. I found the conversation between them because basically he wants somebody to be there with him while he does it. And the conversation, I thought it was a little bit stilted, not quite believable, but not enough to make me decide not to read the book because I thought the writing was really great. And the details about living as a disabled person, I thought were really acute observations. For example, I'll just read you these couple sentences. He's out wheeling around along the shoreline. There's a summer festival and he's eating chips french fries chips he had learned the hard way that seagulls registered the wheelchair rather than the adult in it and read him as an overgrown and helpless child easy to plunder he had lost the best part of a pastry and suffered a nasty peck to the back of one hand before he learnt to eat with his food tucked beneath a jacket or coat lots of little details like that that i thought yeah this is this really I sank right into it, so yeah, I'm going to give it a try. Also, I'm the fact that it's set in Cornwall. I'm I don't know I know almost nothing about Cornwall, but I'm deeply fascinated by it. From uh, uh, what's when we're Muir's uh, Booker nominated novel that was set in Cornwall a couple the the maze the the wake the the water the many the many. Uh, set in Cornwall and even before that it was in Wolf Hall where reference was made to Cornwall Cornish uprisings even during the reign of Henry VIII and uh, it seemed to me like Cornwall is kind of like the Quebec of Britain so anything that's set in Cornwall gets my interest so yeah this one's a keeper hey so it's about 5 30 in the morning and I woke up about an hour ago wide awake and read some more what a beautiful, calm morning. I'm just discovering my neighborhood. And anyway, I'm here to tell you about The Natural Way of Things by Charlotte Wood. Again, 
maybe more than the first two, I am completely smitten by this, the opening chapters of this novel. I really thought this would be the one that I would cull and dispense with. I guess I just didn't remember. You know, the way that the, the way that my memory of the buzz kind of grew stale in my mind, but no. The writing here is, is absolutely gorgeous prose. And it's a really dark story. I said it before, dystopian, but dystopian isn't right. It's it's just a really dark, misogynistic story about uh, a man or a group of men that abduct women and keep them as sex slaves or something like that. And, uh, wow. I don't, I don't want to say too much. It just really, so in the first, the small, short chapters, the first chapter we meet Yolanda. She's been abducted, but she thinks that she, because maybe she had some mental health issues that she's in an, an asylum. Um, and she's, so she's, that's what she thinks, that's where she thinks she is, and she's woken up feeling drugged, wearing very old, uncomfortable uh, nightgown. And we hear a lot about the birds outside, the kookaburras, so it's in Australia. This novel won the Stella Prize in 2016, and boy, I can sure see why on the basis of the first couple chapters. And then we go to the second chapter where we meet uh, Verla, and she's been there a bit longer, and she's lo she and uh, Yolanda are looking at each other across the room, not speaking. Both of them have been drugged. Yol uh, Verla doesn't know how she got there, and just this one sentence about the birds. Here's here's the bird in Japan. That was really They don't know where they are. Okay? They're both drugged. And Verla, this is Verla's perspective. Outside a single white cockatoo shrieks closer and louder until the sound of it fills the room like murder. That is one of the most incredible sentences I've read in a long time. And then they hear men's voices laughing and eating outside, and the voices are coming closer to the room. And as the voices, you know, as the men, as the men's voices get closer and closer to the door, these two women who've barely spoken, and they're both waking from a drugged state, both stand up and instinctively hold hands. <sighs> and I mean, it's the second chapter, so I'll just say that um, young kind of pothead guy comes in. He looks normal and seems friendly and seems half stoned uh, and says, asks them how they feel. And then his friend comes in and the chapter ends where the other guy says to the women, all right, who wants to go first? Really powerful. I think I have to start this book immediately. <sighs> hey again. Okay, well, I have now previewed the fourth book. We Weren't Lovers Like That by Naptesh Sarna. And this is going to be the odd man out. It wasn't horrible, but it didn't grab my interest by the first ten pages, and I c decided not to read further. I did kind of flip around and read a paragraph here and a paragraph there afterwards, but it didn't grip me, and I just thought there's so much incredible Indian fiction that I want to read, and if this hasn't grabbed me from the get-go, and it's got a 3.5 star rating on Goodreads, and it's a debut novel, and it just seems like... You know, it's about a man whose wife dumps him after 
14 years of marriage and he goes back to his rinky-dink poor little poor hometown in India to uh, remember things past and put his life back together it's like yeah it's been done it's been done and uh, I'm no I'm not going to so that's all I'm gonna say because brilliant title I'll give it that much the writing was not horrible and would probably appeal to many of you but it didn't grab me the way the other three books did. I love the epigraph. So my single biggest regret about this book is that I can't do the epigraph tag. Listen to this. It's an anonymous poem. I regret picking and not picking violets. Isn't that fantastic? So, great title, great epigraph. The rest, not so much. I have had a blast doing this tag. I think that I've mistitled it the book on haul edition or the book on haul version because I only on hauled one little book out of the four I think I should call it and maybe henceforth we'll call it the rekindle version not the kindle version the rekindle because it's rekindled my interest and deepened my interest in these three books Robert Drew's The Drowner Patrick Gale's A Perfectly Good Man, and most of, most of all, Charlotte Wood's The Natural Way of Things. I'm really looking forward to giving these a, a try. This will be my first, this will be the first one. This would be the second, in terms of the ones I'd most likely to pick up soonest, and this would be the third, but I'm very intrigued to read all of them. So, I had a blast. I forgot to think about who I wanted to tag. So I'm just going to pick a few n names out of my head at random. I think Wilson Shugart would have a blast with this, so you're tagged. A Curtis of Curtis Books and Books. don't think he's ever done any of my tags that I've ever tagged him in, but I'll try one more time. Chris of Chris Bookish Cauldron. Heidi of My Reading Life. Sorry, I haven't got everybody's name associated with the channel. So, Basking in Books, you're tagged. I believe it's Roz at A Journey Through Books. I know I've got the channel name right. I'm not sure about the name. I think it's Roz. Amy Yuki Vickers. That one's easy. It's your name and your channel name. And Beyond the Pages, Bruno. Ghost Reader. And Jer of Jer Sings and Reads, who just made some uh, gave me a lovely shout-out on his most recent video. Look forward to seeing uh, what you guys come up with, and thanks for watching.